bless the name of the Lord. Come on, praise his name. The Bible declares, what is man? And his days are but a few, and yet filled with trouble. And Jesus said, even the godly would have trouble in these days. And I want to tell you that even this morning in this pandemic, and yes, I use the term pandemic, because it was planned from the start. Even in this pandemic, God is still working for us. The Bible declares that all things work for the good of them that love the Lord and that are called according to his purpose. Amen? So if you call according to God's purpose this morning, I want you to give him some praise. Amen? You should let praise springboard from your heart, off of your tongue, into the lips of God, into the ears of God, because God is good all the time, and the saying is, all the time, God is good. Amen. This is Pastor Scott of Salt Life Storehouse Ministries. Amen. And we just came this morning to uplift the name of the Lord with you this morning. Amen. To issue a word of God to his people in this season, in this time. And we just pray this morning that, that your eyes be open, that your understanding be enlightened. Amen. And that you be brought just a little bit closer to God. Amen. In your truth and in your understanding. Amen. Of the word of God. And once again, this is Salt Light Storehouse Ministries, a place where the word of God is free because my brothers and sisters, that is the way that it should be. Mm -hmm. Amen. This morning, I, I won't be before you long. And uh, I wanted to come to you this morning and talk to you out of a text this morning that's familiar to us all. So if you would, Join me by turning your Bibles to the 13th chapter of Genesis, starting at the ninth verse to the first verse. And that is the first book of the Bible after King James and whoever else tell you that has been translated into these different languages. It's the first book of the Bible, Genesis, the beginning. And it's starting at the 13th chapter, the eighth verse, the ninth verse, I'm sorry, through the 13th verse. Genesis. 13th chapter, 8th verse, 9th verse through the 13th verse. 12th verse. I keep going back and forth. Amen. <laughs> Let me just start reading the word of God. Amen. Father, I thank you this morning. I magnify you, glorify you, bless your name. Come on to you, Lord God, because it's only you, Father, we can just, that we can stand before and ask for your grace and for your mercy to overshadow us, overtake us, and overrun us. Because your word says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life. So we understand this morning, Lord, that goodness and mercy will pursue us, track us down, and chase us down, and overtake us, Lord. So we thank you for your goodness and your mercy this morning that you have shown to us because our eyes are open this morning. We are able to behold another day, more sunshine. And we thank you this morning, Lord. We pray, God, Lord, that as your word go forth, Lord, that your word, O oh God, would illuminate in the minds of your people, that it would light pathways to righteousness, that it would light pathways to your kingdom and pathways to your throne of grace, Lord God, that nothing be said of myself but only that of your word, that it be scriptural and only scriptural, Lord God, that your people may receive a full understanding, Lord. And as John the baptizer was, he was not that light, but he just came to bear witness of that light, so do I. Only to bear witness of the light of Jesus Christ and the light of your word. I pray that any do not know you in the part of their sins, that this morning, God, they come closer and understand and know you. In Jesus' name we pray and give you thanks. Amen and amen. Amen. And the word of God began to read. And first let me say this. This morning I'm standing before my family, amen, my wife, my father, my son, my daughter, and my niece, and as well as my other brothers and sisters, because I have a large family, and that's you guys that are in Christ. Mm. You know, uh, Deacon Eric and Sister Emma and Sister Rachel and the other members that's on this morning, amen. It's a privilege and an honor to stand before you and proclaim the word of God and be entrusted to teach and preach the truth of God's word without adding to it or taking from it. And I think, thank you guys for y'all participation and the support and help that y'all give toward other people. Because that's what this ministry of salt and light is all about. It's about helping other people and not ourselves. Because God has already taken care of us and he continues to do so. Mm -hmm. And we praise him for that this morning. So the book of Genesis starts to read in the 13th chapter, the 8th verse. It starts to read, it says, And Abraham said unto Lot, Let there be no strife. I pray thee between me and thee, 
and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren, we are kin. Is not the whole land before thee separating thyself, I pray thee, from me? If you will take the left hand, then I will go to the right hand. Or if you will depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left hand. And Lot lifted up his eyes unto and beheld the plains of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest to Zorah. Verse 11 says, And then Lot chose him all the plains of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves, the one from the other. And Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot, and dwelt in the city of the plains, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. And the 12th verse again reads, And Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the city of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. This morning I want to say to you that it matters where you set up shop. It matters where you lay down your foundation and your roots. It matters where you set up shop. What we have in the text this morning is that Abraham and Lot were an uncle and a nephew who both believed in the eternal God who created the heavens and the earth. And Lot and Abraham went down into Egypt when there was a famine in the land. And they went down to receive water and food and different things like that because Egypt was plentiful during that time. It had all the things that everybody needed, but it was plague and pestilence on the land at that time. And Abraham went down into Egypt, and he, when he went down into Egypt, just a quick background, he and his wife, his wife Sarah was very beautiful, so Abraham said to Sarah, that, tell these people that you are my sister, because if they find out you're my wife, and because you're so beautiful, that they'll kill me and take you from me. So Sarah lied with Abraham and told Pharaoh that uh, Sarah was his wife, I mean his sister, and Pharaoh had a dream that night, and God told Pharaoh, don't lay his hands on me. Sarah because it was Abraham's wife. So Pharaoh woke up and began to say to Abraham, mute, mute. Pharaoh began to mute. Pharaoh began to wake up and tell Abraham that why did you lie to me? Why did you tell me this was your sister when it really is your wife? So he dispelled Abraham from Egypt and told Abraham to take all that he came with. But then he also gave Abraham more possessions. So when Abraham left, Abraham left with a lot of riches and things of that nature. So him and Lot were very rich when they left. But when they went out into the land of Canaan, uh, they, their sheep began to grow. Their cattle began to grow. Their servants began to grow. Their prosperity began to grow, as many of us know it to be. So it wasn't enough. Their herdsmen began to fight amongst each other because it wasn't enough land and water for the sheep and cattle. So Abraham came to Lot and said, nephew, let's not fight. Why don't we separate? You choose whichever way you choose to go. Now, normally the custom is that the elder would make the first choice, but Abraham, out of his love for his nephew, gave, them, gave him the right to make the first choice. So Abraham chose to go toward the land of Canaan, and Lot chose to go toward the plains of the Jordan, along the river where it was green, because Lot thought that the grass was green on the other side. So the Bible declares that Lot set up shop in the plains of Jordan. And Abraham decided to set up shop toward the green trees of Mary and Hebron, and Lot, his nephew, made the decision to set up shop toward Sodom. And the motivation of each man's heart was determined by the choice and the course that they made. And it, and it also determined the direction of each one of them life, but not theirs only, but the lives of their wives and their children as well. And Lot just wanted to be happy. He wanted to be comfortable. He wanted to have the best life that he could live. He made the obvious choice. 
like many other people would make. We would go toward green pastures. Uh, he chose what many people are choosing today, but he didn't look at the decision that he was making with eyes of wisdom. He didn't look at it from God's perspective. He didn't consider the moral or the eternal cost. He considered that financial gain was more important than his eternal soul. Lot decided to set up shop outside of the outskirts of Sodom and Gomorrah, just close enough to get a glimpse, a bird's eye view of what was going on in the city. Uh, Lot got close enough to hear the music to hear the nightlife. Uh, he heard the DJ spinning the records all night long. And Lot seen the flashing lights and the beautiful disco ball spinning every night. Uh, he saw, he, he smelled the good food that was coming out from amongst the city that was making his way down the hill where he had posted up. He heard that you could always find and have a good time in Sodom. And in Gomorrah. What I want you to know this morning is that Sodom's notoriety stemmed from its moral decay and widespread sexual immorality that went on in the city. This is how Sodom and Gomorrah was really known. It was really known for the contents, the actions of the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. You see, what I want to tell you this morning is to be on the outskirts means to be not far from. You might say this morning that, well, I'm just on the outside looking in. But what I want to say to you this morning, it, 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 it's, like, it's, like, it's like you saying, I don't drink just only on special occasions. It, it, it's like you saying, uh, uh, I don't smoke, I just did a Bill Clinton. I didn't inhale. Or you don't gossip, uh, you just tell the truth. You don't fornicate just sometime, not all the time. I don't cheat on my spouse all the time, just sometime. So to be on the outside, to be on the outskirts, uh, means that you, 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 you say, I'm not a participant, I'm just a spectator. Well, let me tell you something. If something does not correct your life or protect your life, it needs to be ejected from your life. Uh, this includes people, places, and things. Uh, we live in some sad days today while people are running from correction. People are running from the correction that brings protection. People are running from the truth of God, what, what, what God said is wrong. People are now saying it's right. What God said is dark. People are now saying that it's light. People are running from protection. They're running from correction. They're running from the true word that God put out to all men. And I want you to know that it matters where you set up shop. If you set up shop too close to these nouns, these nouns, these people, places, and things that are not profitable for your soul, I want you to know it's dangerous. I want you to take notice this morning in our text, in context of the text. Take notice that lots set up shop right outside of Sodom. Uh, but just in the direction, facing towards Sodom. In other words, my man was headed that way. He was on his way into Sodom. He didn't go in at first. The Bible didn't say he went in at first. It says he pitched his tent outside of Sodom. Uh, he, 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 he just set up outside. He didn't go in at first, but eventually, through the process of time, he made his entrance. He made his way into what everybody else was doing, like so many other people today. It, it, it eventually, first, certain things are detestable to you. Certain things are wrong to you. Certain things ain't right to you. But then eventually, through a process of time, when you just hang out just a little bit, when you just hang around just a little bit, it becomes acceptable. You develop a taste for it. It becomes an acquired taste. It becomes something that you stand in agreement with that you once didn't agree with. You see, he made the choice for him and for his family. And like a lot of people do, through a process of speculation, they eventually become participation. Let me say that again. 
through a process of spectating, you end up becoming participating. Mm. Uh, their eyes and their minds have become callous toward the word of God. And the word callous, I want you to know, means to become hard, uh, 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 to become thick, to become unfeeling due to repetitive wow. Uh, it means that the skin got so hard around their hearts, so thick, that even if you poked it, they still couldn't feel it. And some folks, it's like that. And over time, uh, 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 layers have developed on people's minds and people's eyes to where they can't see and tell and judge what's right and what's wrong. You become insensitive. You become unfeeling. You become unmoved. And this is what's happening in the church today. We have become callous toward God. We have become calluses toward the word of God. We have covered ourselves, our minds, with something that's not true. We have covered our hearts with things that don't belong to God and pertain to God. And a callous, a callous mind is an unrepentant mind. A callous heart is an unrepentant heart. A callous thought is an unrepentant thought. It's a heart that hasn't always been that way. Uh, it didn't get like that overnight. Uh, it was a process. Here a little, there a little. Uh, until a tolerance was developed and it was built up and a taste was formed for what was wrong. And, 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 and the unrepentant mind becomes comfortable with sin. It becomes all right with what's wrong uh, it, because it's covered with layers of wrong. Uh, Lot didn't grasp how dangerous it is to live close to Sodom. Sodom. Uh, uh, like so many people today, uh, if you set up shop outside or around Sodom, the price tag may be more than you expect. Mm. Uh, it can cost you more than you're willing to pay. Mm. Uh, the actual retail price, because the price is right, the actual retail price for all expense paid trip to Sodom can be your marriage. It can cost you your family. It can cost you your job. It can cost you your health. And it can even cost you your eternal soul. It can cost you so much that you may not be willing to pay the price for setting up shop outside of Sodom. Let me help you. You got to stop setting up shop on the outskirts of unhealthy relationships. Mm. You got to stop setting up shop on the outskirts of unhealthy friendships. You got to stop setting up shop around folks who don't mean you no good. You got to stop setting up shop around plastic fake freedoms. You need to stop setting up shop around people, places, and things that are toxic for you. You might not want to hear that. Uh, you need to stop allowing your children to Facebook more than book face them. <laughs> you, you, you need to stop setting up shop in your home before your children with activities that look like the activities that went on in Sodom. Mm. You need to stop setting up shop in your own home before your children with various activities that, 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 that you know that are not godly. And I know you might be expecting a hoop word this morning, but this is one that's tight and it's right. And if your children set up shop in your home. You need to realize that what they set up might not be something that they're willing to pay for. Young folks, it matters where you set up shop as well. Because setting up shop in the wrong place can cost you your education. One day you find yourself going to school and the next day you out of school. One day you find yourself a virgin and the next day you're not a virgin. One day, you find yourself with one boyfriend, then you don't have ten boyfriends. See, I'm here to tell you the truth. You need to be careful where you set up shop. You need to protect yourself when you set up shop. It can cost you your future. In the wrong place, at the wrong time, with the wrong people, can cost you more than you want to pay. Chasing after all the wrong things can lead you to a lot of pain and a lot of heartache. Uh, your paper chase can lead you to waste. You can discard the principles of the scriptures if you want to, which tells you to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all them things 
will be added on to you. You can, you, you, you can go after other things besides after what God desires for you. And you'll find out that the price may be something that you might not want to pay. And what I want to tell you is that you can't walk down two dividing roads at the same time. It's impossible. You can't have, like Deacon Eric told me, one foot in the kingdom of God and another foot in the world. You can't straddle the fence. You got to be hot or you got to be cold. You can't be no in between. Jesus said, you either hot or you cold. Because if you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. You see, you can't be stuck in between. See, because when you're stuck in between, you double mind. Uh, Lot's wife was double minded. She didn't know if she wanted to go to God or if she wanted to stay in Sodom. Uh, in other words, you can't take folks out of Sodom. You may be able to take folks out of Sodom, but you can't take the Sodom out of folks. Mm. See, the Bible declares that when the angels told Lot and his family to abandon, to leave what was wrong, to leave Sodom and Gomorrah, in the process of them leaving, Lot tried to compromise and tell them, but, but, but where will I go? If I leave, where will I turn to? And the angels told Lot to make his way to the hills, to high ground. So when, that, when Lot went about his way, the Bible declares that his wife turned back because she didn't know where she was going to be. Her heart was still in Sodom. Her body was outside, but her mind was still back there. The Bible declares that the angels told him, don't look back. But his wife looked back, and y'all know the story. The Bible says that she turned to a pillar of salt. Because of where our heart was, it was in Sodom. You see, people perish anyway. Because even though they're outside of Sodom, Sodom is still inside of them. Mm. Uh, we live so close to Sodom with the television shows that we watch, uh, the music that we allow to entertain us, uh, the stuff that we watch and we look at on the World Wide Web puts us closer to Sodom. Uh, 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 it begins to set up shop in our minds, in our actions. And when Sodom sets up shop in you, uh, it has you justifying what's wrong and thinking it's right for you. It has you saying, well, what might work for you may not work for me. But what is wrong don't work for none of us. But what is right works for all of us. You see, when you no longer on the outside of Sodom, uh, and you get mixed up in Sodom's activities. Uh, it distorts your vision. Uh, it throws off your moral compass. It convinces you what is right has now become wrong. You cannot and you gotta be careful while you set up shop and while you allow shop to set up in you. You gotta guard the gateways of your mind. Uh, Proverbs 30 and 17 tells us uh, it said the eyes are the windows of the soul. You got to be careful what you put before your eyes. David said, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes, least it cling on to me. You see, let me tell you a story right quick. See, a lot of times when you start out watching pornography, you end up participating in pornography in your mind because you're watching something that can grab a hold to you, something that will cling to you, and wrap you up and won't let you go. The Bible says, David says, I will put nothing wicked before my eyes, least it cling on to me. You see, Job said in the Bible, he said, I made a covenant with my eyes. I, I made an agreement with my eyes not to look with lust because he knew that God was watching everything that he did. And we got to live like we know that God is watching and God sees everything. God sees our thoughts. God sees our actions. The Bible says nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is naked and laid naked and uncovered before God. It's laid naked before the one that we got to give an account to. <clears throat> the Bible says, can a man take fire into his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Let me tell you something. You can't play around with fornication. You can't play around with adultery. And you can't play around with sexual immorality. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Because sex is like a fireplace. Once you get it lit, 
It makes you all comfortable. It gets you all warm and fuzzy. But if it's allowed outside the confinements of that fireplace, it'll spread from room to room until it burns down your whole house. If it gets outside of your marriage, it can burn down your marriage. If it spreads outside of your marriage, it'll burn down your family. If it spreads outside of your marriage, it'll burn down your whole entire future and turn it into nothing but ashes. If it's not contained, it can even take away your health. If it's not in its proper context, in the way that God intended it to be between a man and a woman, it can result in something that you're willing, that you are not willing to pay for. In other words, it should be contained within what God declared it to be. God, God said that marriage is a bed undefiled and that it's honorable. And the ways that you can defile marriage is by sexual immorality, by adultery. You can defile that bed that God said was honorable before him. And if you're not wise, your unwise choice to set up shop in asylum will become critical for you. You go from living on the outskirts of Sodom to living on the inside. You go from detesting what other people do to doing exactly what they do. You go from speaking against what's wrong to speaking up for what's wrong. You go from disliking evil to being all right with evil. You go from uncompromised to compromise. You go from the things of God to the things of the world. The Bible says love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You see, he said that everything in the world will pass away, but the one that abides and obeys God will abide forever. Uh, don't be so conditioned until you can't listen. Don't be so conditioned by the world and the things of the world. Don't be, go, don't, don't be so conditioned by Facebook and Snapchat and Twitter and YouTube <clears throat> and the television. Don't be so conditioned by the things of the world to why you can't listen to what God has to say to you. Don't be so conditioned by what's wrong that you can't tell the difference between right and wrong. Don't be so conditioned till you can't listen. So while you set up shop, you better know that it matters why you set up shop. Somebody asked me at work the other day, they say, Pastor Scott, why do you follow Jesus? And I say, my answer is always the same. Who else you had in mind? Mm. Who else you had in mind for me to follow? Because there's nobody like him. There's nobody like Jesus. There's nobody else I would rather set up shop around. There's nobody else I would recommend or encourage you to set up shop around. There's nobody else like Jesus. You see, there's nobody who can bear my sin. There's nobody who can take the weight of the world on his shoulders. There is nobody like Jesus. There's a song that says, can't nobody do me like Jesus. You see, I've tried a lot of things. I've tried a lot of people. I've tried drugs. I've tried sex outside of marriage. I've tried so many different things, but can't nobody or nothing do me like Jesus. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor nothing else in all of creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God. The Bible declares that if you then be risen with Christ, Set your affections on things above and not on things of the earth. But set your affections on things while Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So I want to encourage you this morning to tell you that it matters, brothers and sisters, while you set up shop. It matters who you set up shop around. It matters why you set up shop. And if you set up shop around Sodom, I'm going to tell you that there's a 99.9% .9 chance that you'll go from outside of South to inside of South. 
And all the things that you detest that other people do and say that you know is wrong, you'll end up doing them yourself. But I want to encourage you this morning to know that Jesus is the one that you should shut up shop around. That if you want to do the right thing, if you want to do, if you want to set up shop, if you want to set up shop, set it up around Jesus. Set it up around the everlasting word of God. Set it around something that will never fail. The word of God says that heaven and earth shall pass away before one dot or one tilt of his word pass. He will always and forever be Jesus. Set up shop around the Lord. Amen. At this time, Asia, come and bless you with a, a song.